Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. A special welcome to those of you watching on OneSpotMedia.com. A reminder as well that you can watch TVJ live by downloading our OneSpot Media app in the Google Play Store or the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the word Spot Media. Statistics revealed today indicate that 241 persons died in motor vehicle crashes since the start of the year. A breakdown of the figures revealed that 62 were pedestrians, 9 were pedal cyclists, 74 were motorcyclists, 11 pillion, 4 were passengers of public passenger vehicles, 29 were private motor vehicle passengers, 6 drivers of commercial vehicles, 2 passengers of commercial motor vehicles, and 44 were drivers of private motor vehicles. The Road Safety Unit in the Ministry of Transport and M Mining is urging motorists to wear their seatbelts, both of drivers and passengers, helmets for motorcyclists and pillion passengers, and pedestrians to use the road with caution. A man is now in hospital in serious condition following a motor vehicle crash along the Cave Main Road in Savannah Mars, Westmoreland this morning. Reports indicate that the man was driving along the Cave Main Road around 10 o'clock when he lost control of the car. The vehicle crashed into an embankment and burst into flames. Residents in the area who heard the explosion rescued the man from the vehicle and called the police. The cops took him to the Savlamar Hospital, where he was admitted. Detectives assigned to the St. Andrews Central Police Division are trying to determine the motive for this fatal stabbing of a doctor at her home on Cunningham Avenue in St. Andrew on Wednesday. She has been identified as 40-year-old Sonia K. Forbes. TVJ News has been informed that she was assigned to the Kingston Public Hospital. Shortly after 7 o'clock Wednesday evening, a relative found Dr. Forbes' body on the floor of her bedroom. It had a stab wound to the abdomen. President of the Jamaica Medical Doctors Association, Dr. Elon Thompson, reacted to Dr. Forbes' killing. Uh, Dr. Forbes was known personally to me. We are still awaiting the investigation results. We are definitely condemning any act of violence against this and all doctors across the country. We just want to send out our heartfelt condolences to our family at this time. Um, I know this must be a difficult time for them. It's definitely a difficult time for the medical fraternity. We are still waiting on further in investigations to continue to find out what exactly happened and get some answers. He also reflected on Dr. Forbes' career. She was a senior resident based at Kingston Public Hospital in the ophthalmology department. Previously, she worked at Conor Regional Hospital, where I used to work as well. And I remember her from, from then. And then we came to work at Kingston Public Hospital together. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton has responded to a performance audit which revealed deficiencies in the operations of the National Health Fund, the NHF. The probe was conducted by Auditor General Pamela Mono Ellis and revealed that the NHF's pharmaceutical division failed to attain its service level targets related to the supply of critical drugs and the treatment of chronic illnesses. Dr. Tufton outlined reasons for the shortage. Um, there are, the, that demand clearly has increased the cost. Um, there were some issues in terms of the procurement arrangements. Mr. Tufton also spoke about internal reforms which are intended to improve efficiencies in the health administration. During the VEN list, to consolidate to benefit from bulk purchases, um, looking at the procurement arrangement in terms of how we buy, accessing the global fund through PAHO so that we can buy in greater bulk through a, 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 a network of countries. Meanwhile, in relation to reports of breaches in protocol at the Savlamar Hospital, Dr. Tufton made these recommendations. And a review of the protocol, which the region has been asked to do, I just submit a report, which will be considered at the level of the ministry, circulated through the other regions, and hopefully become standard operating procedure, signed off by us once we are all consulted and signed off on it. So I'm hoping that the protocol will be strengthened coming out of this unfortunate experience. The second is who is responsible and what actions are to be taken to hold people accountable. 
The island's aviation inspectors are off the job for a second day. However, the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority says the industrial action is not affecting air traffic control services. A majority of the aviation inspectors who provide safety and security oversight started calling in sick yesterday. They are upset about the delay in the 2015-2017 wage negotiations. President of the Jamaica Aviation Inspectors Association, Gary Carr, confirmed that the members will continue their sick out today. He told TVJ News that the Ministry of Labor has called the parties to a meeting on Monday. Dr. Carr signaled that the industrial action will continue pending the outcome of the meeting. Local Government Minister Desmond McKenzie is pledging additional resources to set up drop-in centers for homeless persons and those in infirmaries. He made the pledge at the Clarendon Municipal Corporation meeting on Thursday, where he reiterated the need to improve the way the indigent and the poorest Jamaicans are treated. He maintained it's the government's responsibility to help care for those who cannot care for themselves. Many of them have worked and served the country. And it, it has to be our responsibility. Let it be the challenge of this crop of councillors, whether you are PNP or GLP, that change the face of how we treat people living in our infirmaries across the country. The minister also issued the first set of electronic devices to help improve the work of poor relief officers and councillors in Clarendon. The computers, the laptops and the printers will take the strain that these officers presently work under. Take away the strain, the stress. The tablets that they're getting will now have a mobile app that will put them in a position that right on the spot when they do the investigation, they can download the detail and everything. Gone are the days of the big old books. Sections of Mandeville in Manchester were flooded yesterday. It's reported that after just 15 minutes of rain, sections of Ward Avenue, Caledonia and Perth roads were flooded. This is not the first time sections of the town have been flooded. A recently expanded soakaway along Ward Avenue was expected to solve the problem of flooding in the town. It's why there's concern as a tropical wave is forecast to move across the island today while a trough associated with Tropical Storm Jose is expected to persist across the Central Caribbean and Jamaica through the weekend. As a result, the island is expected to experience period of moderate to heavy showers and isolated thunderstorms across sections of most parishes. Another educational institution has received help with their infrastructure and water problem. The Lenore Blake Early Childhood Basic School in Burnt, Burnt Ground, Santa Cruz, St. Elizabeth, had a section of the building refurbished. They also received a 650-gallon water tank to supply water to the kitchen. The help comes from the Santa Cruz Kiwanis Club. Club president Noel West noted that the refurbishing project cost $600,000. Thanks to the people who contribute to our fundraising projects and to the teachers and the business business community of Santa Cruz who, who provided us with discounts and, and contribution. Also to the bank of JMMB who provided us with, with a contribution and painting the facilities. Ms. Diana McClockin says the refurbishing of the computer room will be essential to the students' education. Children to be exposed to things that they don't have hands-on and hands-on information. And for example, let's say for the curriculum for this semester, we are talking about people from Africa. Now these children have never been to Africa, but using technology, we are able to let them see what happened in Africa, what the people is like, and to etc. So the computer room is very essential at this moment. It also helps to build up their skills, and we also want to build up their critical thinking skills, which will improve their schoolwork as they go from this level to the primary and the secondary level. Meanwhile, close to 30 high school students were recently awarded scholarships on the First Union's BOSA Youth Program. CEO Nicole Jenkins says the company used its social media platform to get persons to suggest students who were most in need based on academic performance and their financial challenges. In the future, I'd love to become a physiotherapist as well as opening my own 
rehabilitation center, which would have a spa and a gym. What I'd like to change about the world is mobility, because there are many people out there who are unable to move as freely as we can. Union CEO made special reference to one of its recipients, whom she says stands out because of the work he's doing in his community in St. Elizabeth. He is a huge help in his community with both the younger students and children doing homework as well as the elderly. And that's really remarkable and that's exactly what, you know, we as the younger generation need to keep alive. And time now for our fact or fiction feature. Fact or fiction. On October 31, 1671, Jamaica became the first British colony to establish a post office. We'll tell you the answer at the end of the sports segment of the newscast. In international news, an improvised explosive device was detonated on a tube train in southwest London during Friday's, Friday morning's rush hour. The blast at Parsons Green Station is being treated as terrorism. 22 people have been treated in hospitals, mostly for burns, though at least eight have now been discharged. A hunt for the person who placed the device is on the way, and the area around the station has been evacuated. We go to the CNN for more. We've just heard from the police. They are declaring this a terrorist incident. So breaking news coming to CNN that a terror incident has indeed taken place here in London today in this area of London. It's a residential area. It's Fulham. It's deserted right now because there's been a cordon put around it. I'm just going to read out the police statement because this is the sort of confirmed information that we can give you right now in this vacuum of information and people desperately want to know what happened. So the police are saying that officers from the Met's Counter-Terrorism Command are investigating after an incident on that tube line that you're looking at this morning. Police were called at about 8.20 on Friday to Parsons Green Underground Station following reports of a fire on the train. The Deputy Assistant Commissioner uh, Neil Basu, the Senior National Coordinator for Counter-Terror Policing, has declared it a terror incident. That's just happened in the last couple of minutes. Officers from the Met Police Service and the British Transport Police attended the scene, along with colleagues from the London Fire Brigade and London Ambulance Service, all present at present, we are aware of a number of people who have suffered injuries. Uh, it's too early to confirm the cause of the fire, though, which will be subject to the investigation that's now underway by the Met's Counter-Terrorism Command. So they're heading this up now. station remains cordoned off, as you can see. They're advising people still to avoid the area, so there's obviously something there that they, uh, they feel is some sort of threat. We turn now to sports. With an expected no-confidence motion averted at Wednesday's council meeting, the Handel lemi led Amateur Swimming Association of Jamaica executive is expressing confidence in, their, in seeing out their remaining two months in charge. The confidence motion was not raised at the near four-hour meeting in Kingston on Wednesday evening, with the ACJ informing two clubs, Swimmers Aquatic and y Speedos, via email, that the requested special general meeting to move the no-confidence motion could not be held as it was not made in time and therefore not in accordance with the ACJ's Articles of Association. According to the ACJ Constitution, a requested special general meeting can only be held 28 days after receipt by the General Secretary of the Association. TVJ Sports is in possession of documents showing the ACJ only responded earlier this week to the letter sent by the clubs from August. But despite the continued internal wranglings, ACJ President Handel Lamy says he feels no pressure and that pressing matters have been sorted out. Um, certainly not. Um, when we are called to positions of leadership, we have to exhibit all the qualities of good leadership. Um, namely, being able to direct and um, motivate the people around you. And secondly, if there are issues, deal with the issues. We have certain um, issues presently within the organization. The problems that we have are not insurmountable. They are all solvable. We all have to come together and decide to work together. Sources say the clubs have been told they can wait until November's scheduled annual general meeting to vote for new executive officers. We will continue with our program to plan for care after 2018 and to carry out swimming in Jamaica um, straight until the end of my term and which we will have our AGM, which we will present um, 
ourselves or whoever seek to present themselves for re um, election, and they do have that right to do so. If the no confidence motion had been passed, it would have been the second one since December 2016 to be made against Lamy and his executive. It is further understood that a motion was moved at Wednesday night's council meeting to censor ACJ council members who speak with the media or approach sponsors without permission. And finally this afternoon, the answer to our fact or fiction feature. We asked, fact or fiction? On October 31, 1671, Jamaica became the first British colony to establish a post office. Well, that's a fact. On October 31, Jamaica established its first post office in what is now Spanish Town. In 1776, the main post office was relocated from Spanish Town to Harbour Street in Kingston. The Jamaica Postal Service operated as a sub-branch of the British Post Office until 1860, when it achieved full man man managerial and operational autonomy. Following the 1907 earthquake, the main post office was again relocated, this time to the General Post Office on King Street in downtown Kingston. And that's the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon and have a great weekend.